So uh, my goal is to uh, tell you something about my experience using Prolog to build a, a simple and small and useful web service for a couple of my friends who wanted to solve a specific problem that has several aspects that fit very well to what Prolog can offer. So I tried it. I actually had some prior Prolog experience, so, so I knew what uh, it can do. And the problem that uh, was to be solved was uh, were cooking recipes. Uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, there are big parts of the world where uh, still um, imperial units are used. Uh, I think it's USA, Liberia, and uh, some third country. So if you have some US or Liberian recipe, and if you want to use it, then it might be useful in certain cases to convert the units into, uh, into, into the metric system. And the problem in this is that the recipes is usually sort of a free-form text that somewhere, uh, it's not really that strictly formatted. So you need to have a sort of a clever parser to first take the recipe and use the parser to, ex to, to extract the information. And then you have to have some domain knowledge that works together with the parser to actually understand what's there and to be able to provide the conversion and the output text that's, um, that's uh, annotated with, um, the, with the converted values. And third, uh, you'd certainly like to make uh, this application as accessible as possible for everyone. So um, it's certainly a good idea to make it a web, web service. So um, it happens that Prolog uh, has a built-in web server, so you can use it for this uh, kind of stuff. It has uh, a sub-language called DCG uh, that's very, very uh, well suited for writing uh, grammars. So you can write parsers very nicely. And third, uh, yes, you can express domain knowledge uh, in a very nice way in Prolog. So it happens to really have all these three properties. So I tried it, and it turned out to be a very pleasant experience developing this kind of uh, sort of, it's nothing big, it's a small sort of uh, a toy that is actually not a toy. It's, it's used by, by, by a lot of people who, who um, sort of expressed uh, this wish. So uh, now let's go through the stuff in a little bit more structured way. So, yeah, so, so these are information that are either not new or not interesting with the real product. My name is Pavel Bajan and I'm the developer at Idealine Solutions. Um, so let's, let's start. So I'd like to present you specifically uh, SWI Prolog, which is uh, um, open source implementation of Prolog. You can download it and it's quite feature rich, so if you want to try one of the implementations, there are several, but the, this one, as uh, Sweep Prolog, is uh, one of the, the most uh, featureful you can, you can get. Actually, the most featureful, like, I'd say. I don't know about the commercial ones, so there is Sixtus Prolog and others, they are also very good, but among the free ones, this one is definitely uh, uh, one of the top choices. Uh, the important thing is that it um, has a very nice HTTP library, so you can write servers and clients uh, as you like. Uh, it's easy to express uh, the server in sort of a declarative way, just a couple of things that you configure and you're up and running. You have a web server. Uh, what is very nice uh, is um, you have a complete development environment that I'll try to sort of show you in a, while, uh, in a minute. Uh, syntax highlighting, graphical debugger, a good documentation, and many useful libraries. Now, in general, Prolog, as said, it makes it easy to express domain knowledge in an executable form. So you sort of, if you do it the right way, it's not always so easy. But if you do it uh, right, then you sort of have a feeling that you are writing down the, the domain knowledge, like sort of, in, like a specification of the problem. And at the same time, it's executable. So it sort of 
a little bit like executable specification, but of course it's not always so easy. So if you just uh, use it blindly, then it won't be very fast, and there are some problems. But it has this flavor, uh, as I will show in a minute. And uh, fourth, what was very nice about this project is that I was able to use a single language for for all those things. So I didn't have to solve various those uh, impedance mismatch uh, things and so. So it was nice that I could just stay in one language, and uh, that was very nice. Okay. So um, as I already said, the problem was. Text annotation. So I had to take some text and parse it, understand it, and then annotate it with some useful information. So uh, any problem that is of this kind could be solved in this uh, in this uh, way. It doesn't have to be recipes, of course. So the problem is text annotation. Um, it involves domain domain knowledge. You have to know what uh, what combinations of the tokens in the input are sort of valid. So you have to know the domain. To know what is it about, for example, uh, you, it's useful to know that certain inputs, like one million pounds flour or or a billion of apples, is uh, not a very likely input as a recipe. So, so you can express this domain knowledge to to help the program with better. So there is the, the, but there was a contrite example, but. There is a lot of things that are really tied to the domain. You can, you can express it as, as, uh, as I'll show you. And um, the other thing is that you need parsing. So I included here uh, an example how you write how you write a grammar rule. Uh, are you familiar with grammar rules? Sort of. It's it's like sort of a natural thing. I could perhaps. Uh, is there some kind of pointer or something like that? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, uh, nom 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 nom. nom. <laughs> so, Prolog has a feature called DCG, which is actually a set of macros. So it's not really uh, part of the core prolog, but it's a set of macros that are sort of standard. So in almost any prolog system you, you would install there will be by default those macros. And those macros implement a language for describing grammars. Yeah, so so you, you, are, you, you, you can talk about grammar rules which are then play very nicely with the rest of the problem. So, so I, I won't go into many details. I just want you to, to look sort of like those, because there is not enough time to really explain everything in every detail. That will be like a pro, of course, and that will be, so now I don't know, uh, five hours, something like that. So uh, you can write this. You can say, okay, so a parenthesized phrase is anything that is, um, token of this form. I have those wrappers here because I can sort of talk about uppercase and lowercase, which I need in many cases. So if I say, th this is a function I, I, I wrote or, or a predicate, yeah? It's not very important. It just says, I don't care about the case of this token. So we suppose that we already have the text split into tokens. I'll show you the token either later. And it just says the, the one, if something's parenthesized, then you have a token that's opening parenthesis, then you have that phrase, uh, unfortunately due to some changes in, in, um, in between version 6 and 7, I had to include this quick hack. I could sort of um, do it in a different way, so don't, don't care, uh, don't look at this, yeah? So it's just, then comes the phrase that, that we are, so, so that's a variable. Yeah, it can be anything, anything, any phrase, any sequence and slogans, and then you have the closing. Yeah. So you can um, express 
grammar rules that are sort of parametrized rules. You can express uh, all sorts of more complicated patterns. So that's nice. And uh, you can express, you can sort of mix the programming styles a little bit. So you, here you, it's, you, you're talking about, you can talk about the, uh, another grammar rule which uh, describes something what I call simple fraction. Because in most recipes you have numerical values that are expressed in very funny ways. Like sometimes a Unicode fraction, like zero thirds, or one third, whatever, and sometimes you have um, just a number, slash, and another number, and you have, uh, those people are writing this stuff in very funny ways, I can assure you. It's meant for humans to do that kind of stroke. And uh, I can express this grammar rule in this way. I say a simple fraction is a simple number, which is something Another grammar rule that's defined elsewhere. Here I capture, I capture the value. So I'm when when this parser defined by this grammar rule is executing, what happens is that you use some other machinery to provide it with the input. And it, it does its thing. So it says, okay, in order to parse this value, I have to parse first this thing, then thing, and another one. Then I have to parse something that is a slash, because it's a fraction, so you have to have a slash symbol somewhere. And then you parse another simple number in this order. So the order is important. And you can express it in this way. And you are telling the parser, and by the way, while parsing, please store the values for me, so I can use them. So this is an attributed grammar. Yeah? And those, uh, those, so those numbers are then stored in these variables. And I can, so I store a simple number, uh, the, the, the extra value of the number in, in the variable num. Then I parse a slash. And I can have pure prolog code, code here, which is indicated by these uh, <coughs> sort of uh, curly braces that are saying what. So, so this is not uh, not um, a grammar rule element per se, but it's just some uh, additional constraint that you can write in uh, in the language pro itself. So you can mix the grammar language with the prolog language and do some checking. So what I'm doing is, is, is that I'm demanding, oh, by the way, this slash, it has to be a slash symbol. And what is a slash symbol? That's here, and that's the domain knowledge. So you are saying, oh, so a slash symbol is either this or this uh, slightly different slash. It looks almost the same, but it's a different unicode point. And I can assure you that that in those recipes, you, you, you will encounter all flashes that exist in the universe. <laughs> because it's just, it's free-form text. So, so people just, they, they just take any, anything that resembles the right thing and then use it, they use it. So you have to, you have to solve, encode this, this, uh, this knowledge somehow. And you encode it in a, in a very simple way. So you say, this is a slash symbol, and this is also a slash symbol. Yeah? So you can express it in, in, in this nice way. And then you can do some calculation along the way. So while parsing, you say, okay, okay, parse this, parse that, and, and parse this. And at the end, in order to, um, to set the variable value to the, to the demanded value, you just divide the numerator with the denominator. Because I, I, I don't actually need to keep track. I could have. I could just keep the information what is the numerator and denominator. But this number will eventually be <coughs> multiplied by some funny conversion between pounds and kilograms anyway. So in this case, I just divide those numbers and then return a real number. It's easier this way. Yeah? Yeah? 
so is it right that value uh, has type uh, string here? Or it's not a string? Uh, value uh, is a real number. The type is, uh, is a real number. Okay. Because it, it just, what it does is uh, this simple number, if you, it's a, this is a very good question. So uh, this grammar rule, which I, I do not show the definition of simple number, but I wrote it in such a way that it not only parses the string, but it also converts it into uh, an actual number. So, so at that point, it's already a number. OK, so actually, I have another question. How <laughs> num and value are uh, like connected in this way? Because it will be more obvious if simple number uh, fact or predicate will depend on both num and value. So it's like you tell the simple number predicates value, and it returns you a num. So it uh, I have a complementary question maybe because what confuses confused me at the beginning is that uh, in color every input is a parameter of the child literally uh, but the, here the string which is being parsed is somehow uh, it's an out parameter that's that is so, I, I, so oh, it's oh, somehow oh. invisible yeah, yeah, so, so that's why I, I should have stressed that. So the point of this is that you express the grammar rule, so the logic itself. And then you use uh, an, um, another function or... or I, I, if I say predicate, then just imagine it's some kind of a procedure. So you can call a predicate, and it's some thing that you can call in various ways, and it does some things. So it's, I, I, I don't want to really um, a, a predicate has um, it, it's a thing that expresses a relation but when programming in Prolog you sort of have to think operationally also you cannot really think all the time in terms of uh, the relations because then the result would not be very efficient if you ignore this part of so I intentionally sort of started without explaining it really formally and let's see what it does. But, <laughs> but uh, the point is that, um, that this structure is then called by another mechanism and this another mechanism adds parameters that actually are holding the strings that are processed. But when writing the grammar rules, you do not want to really uh, have those parse things visible because that would not be the abstraction. So it would not be a grammar uh, anymore. And it would be just a code that implements a grammar parsing, but it won't, won't be the rule itself. And actually, is this magic uh, arrow like a part of this uh, magic mechanism that you're talking about? Like what? Yeah. Oh. Like this magic arrow. Uh, in the end of the line with simple fraction. So because if you... So this... Uh, uh, please ask the question again. Uh, if I remember correctly, when you have a predicate in Prolog, in Prolog the definition should contain um, uh, a semicolon and a minus. So stuff like that. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And this is yeah. uh, like an error. So. Yeah. And That's because we are using the grammar library. Okay. Yeah. So if it were just a predicate, well, it compiles to a predicate. It's implementation. It's implemented in this way. That it's a macro that compiles to a predicate. Uh, but um, and predicate is a sort of like a function, but it's not restricted to. It's just a general relation. So, so it's a generalization of, fun of a function. So you can, yeah, it's, it's not very, you, you can use predicates as functions, and it's done all the time. And the, the point is that I just wanted to uh, show you sort of the, uh, just the, how, how simple it is or, or to, to express it and, and without really going too much into detail with regards to the operational semantics of all this stuff. So just, if it's a fraction, is a number, you store it in a variable, then you uh, 
expect that you find uh, some kind of slash, then you check that it's the right kind of slash while referring to some a database of information, and then you check that what follows is another number, and then you, you store the other number in a different variable. It's, it's sort of an out variable. Yeah? And then you compute the, 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 uh, the, the you divide those numbers and, and uh, assign the, the result to, to, uh, to value. And you, you check that the denominator is greater than zero <laughs> because otherwise it, will, it's, it would need not make sense in, uh, in this domain of recipes. People are not using like take minus three minus fifths pounds or something. No. You can forbid it. Okay, so, so um, that's it. Um, now, quick, yeah? So, in general, Prolog has many nice properties for the programming point of view. Uh, immutable data by default, mutation possible but discouraged. Then it's very similar in, to Lisp uh, in its uh, treatment of macros. So, Prolog is... Uh, The, uh, a program in Prolog is a sequence of its own universal data structure, which is called a term. So like in Lisp or Clojure, you have, you, everything is basically lists, and, um, and not, not really, but everything is structured using lists. Mainly in Prolog, you structure things by using terms, which uh, is a similar thing, and Prolog programs are terms. So you can use the same idea as in Lisp. In Lisp, you have this idea that you transform Lisp programs with Lisp programs. The very same thing you can do in Prolog in a very nice way. So you have structural Lisp style macros. Macros are specified in Prolog itself, so you use it, use it as a macro language uh, to define the macros. But Prolog is good at manipulating structures, which makes it a great macro language, and then go to 10. Uh, it, it really works very, very nice. Um, another nice property, it, it has uh, pattern matching. So if you're familiar with uh, functional languages, you know what pattern matching is. And Prolog has a, a special, especially powerful form of pattern ma matching called unification. Basically, it means that if you have some data, you can sort of have holes in those data at both sides, and it pattern matches Better matches in both directions. So if, if you imagine like uh, pattern matching in functional programming, you have sort, some sort of a template and some sort of data and you're trying to fit those data into this template, into, into the holes. And it sort of, it, it, if it doesn't match, then, then you try another clause and, and it, if it doesn't match at all uh, in a pattern match expression, then it's sort of an expression, whatever. Yeah, it's, um, exception. Yeah? So you are sort of, you have, you have data and you have holes and you are trying to fit those data into those, into the pattern, into the template. It's basically the same thing. And in Prolog you can have the holes on both sides. So you can do like a generalization of, of, of pattern matching, which is called unification. Um, perhaps I could, so, so my intention is to go through the slides and then uh, just show the rattle and just play with it and, and uh, show some stuff and that. So I didn't really want to spend too much time uh, with, with, uh, with this. Yeah. So some more nice properties. Um, you can define new operators. That's not really specific to logic programming, but it's just there, so you can use it and that's nice. Yeah? Okay. Um, it comes with some, uh, a couple of other uh, languages. So I mentioned the DCG, that's sort of a language, uh, domain-specific language embedded into Prolog. And then there are others, uh, and a very powerful such language is uh, CLPFD, which uh, is constraint logic programming over finite domains, which means that you can express constraints that are not just structural, like this list has a length of three elements and that, but it allows you to um, express constraints that involve 
uh, integers. So Prolog, pure Prolog is not capable of doing this, but there's a library that, that allows you to teach Prolog to, to, to do this. Yes, and I'll, I'll show some examples, but, but here is an example for the uh, Prolog side. So this language teaches Prolog a couple of new operators. So if you didn't use uh, this language, Prolog wouldn't know this operator, this hash and, and uh, then some modulation of uh, integer operator. And if you use this module, then suddenly you can use uh, something a little bit richer than pure Prolog. And um, you can express, for example, uh, the constraints uh, that are involved in the um, Queen's um, puzzle. Okay? So you have a uh, checkerboard and you have queens and you, you want those queens not to, to attack each other. So no, pair that, so, so no pair of queens should be on, a, on the same row, on the same column or on the same uh, diagonal. And you can express it in a quite succinct way and you can actually run this. You can run this and it will generate, it will successfully find the, the solutions to this problem. So you're basically saying, okay, so I'm saying that I will be talking about n queens. So if you provide me n, which is the number of queens, I will return you a list of positions of those queens. So what you know is that you can, there are not, uh, if you take a column, there is at most one queen, actually exactly one, because you, you have to have uh, n queens for an n by n board, so there has to be exactly one. So, so this part you do in your head to simplify the program a little bit. And so you describe the board with a list of length n. So in Prolog, a lot of things on based on lists, so, so the predicates that operate on lists usually don't have the name list in, uh, in, in their name because it's sort of implicit, because almost always are like using lists. So if, if, if you have a predicate length, it means length of a list, actually, yeah? So you're saying, oh, I want I want to be true that Q's, that, that, that uh, the list Q's has the length n. And so you declare that it has to have this length, and what Pro does is that it, it, it tries to make this true, so it, it builds a list that has that length. So you can use it to count the number of elements or to construct a list with a given number of elements. I, I'll go into detail a little bit later. So you can, and then you say, okay, and I want those positions of those queens to be between one and n. Otherwise they would be outside the board. So that's not allowed. So you declare that you want every element, every queen has to be in this range. And then you say, okay, and I want some additional constraints to be true, which for the sake of readability are separated into another set of predicates that are handling um, the other restrictions of the puzzle. So you declare the structure of the problem. And then, which is not shown here, because the slide was too small, but then you can call uh, a predicate that enumerates the solutions. So you first declare the domain knowledge, and then you, as a second step, you can write it, run it through some sort of machinery that, that reads this description and uses this description to find all the solutions to the puzzle. As I already sort of, I didn't say explicitly, so Prolog is a language based on relations. 
So you can use it in a functional way. You can use prolog just as if you were using functions without gotcha, sort of. But you can do it. And you can use it in a more general way where you are not working just with functions, but with something slightly more general with relations. And it turns out that if you have, you can sort of run functions backwards. So if you had a conversion function, that's just a very silly example, yeah. But normally in In a regular language, yeah, you just have a function that converts some oh foo bar. Yeah, it has to be foo bar. Converts it to to its Unicode code points. So that's that's a, a function that you are likely to find in a lot of languages uh, in a sort of a standard library library. And of course, Prolog has such a function, it's called atom codes, and it converts an atom, which is sort of a basic data type in Prolog, to the Unicode code points that, um, that uh, comprise it. Yeah, so it's a big deal. So if, if this were, I don't know, in C sharp, then you could imagine, so well, this is the input argument, and this is an out parameter. So it would look sort of a very similar. So you use it as a function, and instead of returning the value, you just you you, you can you can store it in an, in an out parameter, no problem. But in Prolog, the Prolog is uh, more general. So in in many cases, you can run it backwards. So, so it to the code and the oh. oh yeah, I see. Ignore those other things, yeah, for for now. And I'm afraid that I may be uh, obstructing the view, or or not. Well, tell me if I'm. I, uh, so you can do it the other way around, and that's the cool thing that I, I that uh, um, is, yeah. You see. So you can write it in an other way. So it's sort of practical that many functions, instead of having two functions for conversions, you have just one. You have to remember just one. And it goes further, and I already sh uh, show that here with append. You have, so in, in a function-based language, you could write, okay, so I have two lists, let's say one, two, three, or five, six, and I just want them appended and stored in an out parameter. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that's, you could very well imagine something like that in a, in a, in a regular function-based language that has output parameters. Yeah. And probably it will be more more, more obvious um, about how all these facts and predicates work if you call atom codes with both uh, like arguments field. So like atom codes d e and these numbers and will and yeah. it will re re return true. And actually, yeah, 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 that's true. these two objects uh, have this relation, and it's true. Yes, that, that's, uh, that's a good point. I actually wanted to sort of start with a form that resembles fu a function as much as possible. Because I didn't, I, my goal is to um, start with something that really looks like a call in C-sharp and go from, yeah, and it, it doesn't have to be C-sharp, because I, I just know that C-sharp has out parameters that are other. But, but it really, you can imagine it like that, it, it, it works this way. Yeah? It just, you, you give, give it some inputs and it's able to spit out some output. But what it actually does is that it has a relation between those parameters. And if, if you fill in enough of them, then it will infer what the others have to be. So that's the actual deeper mechanism that's there. Yeah? And it can do it in various ways, not always, but in many cases it can do in various ways. So, okay, so just let's so, uh, let's uh, let's show it um, that if I 
how is that? If I just fill all the parameters, it, it just says true. It says, okay, so that's no problem, that's true. If it's not true, it says false. But usually, during the calculation, of course, what's happening is that some of those variables are unknown. And what you're doing is you're using the prolog engine to find their values. Yeah? But it can do other stuff as well. So if you start with, I don't know, with this, uh, uh, and you just tell it that, okay, so I, I want to find x such that, that when you append it to 1, 2, 3, you get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And it's able to, to infer that x has to be this value. And actually, you can do more weird stuff and say, OK, what about this? And it says, OK, I don't know, really. But one possibility is that I just set x to an empty list and y to the rest, or this way, or this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. So gradually, we are seeing that it's uh, that, that now we are getting to the relational nature of all this stuff. Yeah? And you can do a couple of other weird things. So let's say, OK. Excuse me, wait for uh, Sorry? Wait for uh, Because there are no other solutions. That's confusing. I agree. Because I was pressing my give me a lot of solution. And it was running the, the code again and again, but trying to find another solution. And at the end, it says, no, there are no other solutions. And you can do, for example, this. Let's call it Z. Yeah. And it tells you it just doesn't care about the value here. You, it just knows, OK, so, so you say z, I don't know what z is, but I don't need z in, on, in order to be able to infer that those are the ways to split the list. Yeah? Or you can say that you want a list that is, you, you, you get by appending two lists, two identical lists. Yeah? And it tells you, OK, so either this or, and now it, it, uh, it has to come out with some names for the variables in the lists. So it, used some, it uses some automatic scheme for, for naming variables. Because there's going to be many variables that are unknown. Also, it has to have some name for them. And it just tells you, OK, so, but if you look closely, it, it, it really works. So, so it is a list of length 2, so, so it is uh, appended with the same list of length 2. So the, the system knows, OK, so this is unknown, but whatever this unknown is going to be, in any time in the future, it has to be on a, it has to be the same value as this one. So, yes, a board. So it keeps tracks of the relations in a, in a, in a sound way. Tries to. So, let's go through the slides very quickly. And then I'd like to show you some real pro code because real code is much more messy and that's interesting. This is all like toy stuff, but there is, you can really use it in a practical way. And this is like the stuff that you are likely to see in a, in, a, in a course at school. And it's, per se, it's not actually that useful. It's just <laughs> nothing. Yeah, so, but, but that's practical. So you can use the predicate instead of a couple of functions. Because you'd have to have several functions that I like working in various ways. 
And you can express that anyway as a single predicate in Prolog in many cases, which is sort of practical. You have to remember less, less, uh, less uh, stuff. Uh, you can influence the execution of a predicate by providing with a partially filled out output template. That's what I, I, I was showing. Um, yeah, so this is, um, you can do a lot of weird stuff here, so you can, you can sort of uh, torture Prolog by letting it try to find solutions in vain and, and you do it in this way. <laughs> If you say, okay, so let's try to, so, so I, I won't torture it now. So if I ask it for solutions to this predicate, it says, okay, so if X is member of this list, then it has to be either one, two, three, or blah, blah, blah. But I can do this stuff. I can print X. And it also prints it, so it has side effects. You can just print to the console. You're not, uh, you are allowed to do this. And <laughs> you can do now this. You can say, okay, so I want you to find such values for x that x is a member of this list and true is false. Yeah? True is false, but the way that Prolog does it, it, it doesn't look at, at it as a wall. It's actually quite stupid. I, I sort of made the impression that it's super smart, but it's super stupid actually, which is a good thing because it's very easy to understand very precisely in which order and in which way uh, the solutions are tried. It just tries them, like it tries the first solution of this one and then it tries to satisfy the other one, and if it doesn't work, then it goes back. It's called backtracking, a mechanism in the implementation that does it. And, uh, and that's a part of the operational semantics, this backtracking thing. And uh, it goes back and tries another solution and doesn't see that, that no matter what value x has, false is never going to be true. But you can use it to to sort of make a for loop, <laughs> and that's that's called a failure-driven loop, and it's it's useful sometimes. So if you if, if all the concerns it's, it are some side effects, you can uh, you can uh, use it um, to make loops in this way, and it's quite concise. So it has some value, but it's it's not really something that you would be doing every day. It's, but it's just sort of a a useful uh, joke. Okay, so what else? Um, there are predicates that can call themselves, and it's actually used quite a lot. This uh, recursive, recursive style of programming is very similar to when a function calls itself, yeah, just a recursion. And for this reason, Prolog has tail call optimization. So you can do this kind of programming without being afraid that you run out, run out of tech. Just telco optimization. You can create cyclic structures. So, oh, whoa. No. Cyclic structures in this way. So, so this is actually very interesting because as far as I know, it's, it's not really possible to create cyclic structures in, like if you don't use any mutation in functional languages, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but it, you cannot do it because you have to, if, you, if we want to have a list that sort of is connected to its beginning, then you don't know where to start, start while building the, the structure. So you have to some, have to some transaction and whatever, yeah. But in Prolog it's easy. You just say, okay, so A is a list that contains itself and it, it just accepts it. So, so it, 
it's able to, to hold this, um, uh, to work with this value. Now, really, A is a variable that points to a list that points to itself, which is first element is the list itself. It really is. So you can create cycles in structures. So you can create general graphs uh, where it's very easy to, to navigate from one, one part of the structure to another without any sort of indexing because it's just there. It's just pointers. That's Actually. What actually happened when we try to get ahead of this list? Uh huh. Great question. So we can let's try to decapitate it. So I first prepare the data, and this is like a semicolon in other languages. So it first executes this, and then read the other thing, and so like it's just comma in pro. And let's try it. So let's say that. I want to talk about B and I want to perform a pattern matching, actually unification, but sort of a pattern matching. And I want to have the head and tail. Oh, oh no, no, no. I want to have A and I want to split it into head and tail. But that's what we wanted to try. Okay? So it tells you that it's a list that has one element. <laughs> it has one element. So it has, okay, so it's a list that has one element. And the head is there for something, and the tail is empty. Yeah? Question answered? Well, not really. So, uh, yeah, probably the question is still answered, but I'm not sure what that means. So. Uh, head is a list with uh, itself, so so like a list has only one element, yeah. Yes, and the element is itself. Well, yeah, maybe it's it's a little bit. Uh, it causes problems in certain cases because if if you're if you imagine that you sort of uh, that this is an um, actually an infinite infinite data structure that has infinitely many copies of itself. So if you really roll, um, how is it called? If you um, unroll it, if you unroll this representation so sort of mathematically, then you could view it, okay, it's actually an infinite data structure. And this fact that it is infinite causes problems in certain certain cases. And also so you can forbid it. There's a flag in prolog that you can use in certain cases, and you can forbid it from, uh, you can prevent it from allowing this. But you can use it, but then you have to be careful. Uh, I don't have time to do it. So and also, it's, it's, it is strange. So, so you have to be careful. Yeah. Does it mean that list in product would contain like uh, various types of values? Yes. It's like, it's, uh, there are heterogeneous lists uh, uh, of the same nature, like, like in, in, in Lisp or something like that. So these are not, not arrays. They are really, really lists of, of stuff. So if you have like an atom, and then you'd have some kind of string, whatever, a number, yeah. And it, it treats, it has several kinds of strings, and one of them is just a list of Unicode code points. Code points. But this is just a really specific tool. It's, it's not. Uh, it's not important. It's not important. Okay. And you can do higher order programming, which is very nice. So you have predicates that have arguments, that have input arguments, that are predicates too. So there's a predicate call, you can call another predicate. So it's like eval, actually. So you can, you can eval, and you can uh, map things like in functional programming. Map list. So you can, for example, you could do this. You, you could say map list, yeah, and you would have atom codes, and here you would have a couple of atoms A, B, C, C, uh, go, foo, bar, and here you want to have the output, and it. Uh, does the mapping, yeah? So it it converts each of those elements 
using the, by calling the atom codes predicate, and it, it takes the second the various values of the second argument of atom codes and uses them to build the output list that's then inserted into the out argument y, and then it tells you what is the result of this. Uh, was it clear, or? And you can use it the other way around, and, and that's, that's, that's nice, in my opinion. So, so you just say, okay, uh, I don't know, let's take some, let's take, um, let's use it uh, in reverse. Yeah? So I took the list of lists, lists of lists of lists of, of Unicode code points, and I just run it backwards. So now I, from codes, I get the actual letters. Yeah. So, uh, and it's happy to, to do it. So it sort of has a very nice flexibility in this regard, which I really enjoy, personally. Oh, what else? What next? Yeah, you can do higher-order programming. But there are cons, too. It's possible to use lambda expressions, but there are some issues. So in many cases, you want some throwaway function or throwaway predicate. If I'm saying function, it's always a predicate that you can sort of use it as a function. And uh, you have to write some helper function for that. There is a library that sort of implements lambda expressions. It, it looks like it's, it's usable, but there are some gotchas that you have to be very careful not to use any variables that are already used elsewhere. Like, like with the same name because it, it's not very easy to do checking of this stuff. So there will be some more evolution regarding the lambda expressions. So personally, this is one of the weaknesses that, that, um, that there is no totally robust way to use lambda in, in Chrome. And that, so, so it forces you either to, to, to have to be careful uh, with those gotchas that I don't want to describe, but there are such like gotchas, or you have to write helper functions, which is uh, annoying. So you can do it, but you have to come out with some name, like uh, this, my helper, whatever. And uh, yeah, so this is a con. Then there are some speed issues. It's still reasonably fast, but it's in the, yeah, it's a dynamic language, so, so it's, it's not really that, that fast. And the problem with Prolog specifically is the boundary between logical and extra logical code is not always clear. So I told you that Prolog is out of predicates, except that's not true. Because the engine itself has a lot of features that totally break this, uh, this uh, notion. So there are features to, to, to really mutate stuff. So, so you can sort of run a predicate that builds some structure that has some logical, logical uh, bindings in it or logical relations. And then you can use another, it's called predicate, but actually it's a procedure disguised as a predicate. And it uh, it will just uh, mutate the data, and this breaks uh, the logical meaning of the program. And there are many such features in Prolog that, for example, this thing called cut operator. So you can tell Prolog not to find any more solutions. Yeah, so so if you are trying to if, if, you can tell Prolog, okay, and by the way, if you are at this point of generating solutions to a relation, stop. Don't find any others. But this, this um, is a problem because it then very much depends on which way you run the predicate, whether you insert the input in the second argument and expect the output in the first one, or the other way around. And you have to be very careful to use these extra logical features to package them in, in a way that such that from outside when you use the piece of code it still behaves relationally. 
and you have to do it really, uh, really carefully. So there are sort of dangerous features that uh, are not easy to use in a way that doesn't break uh, the logical nature of them. So, so in reality, there are many programs that are actually not in pure logical style. And the final problem that I perceive is that if you really want to work with the special case of relations, which is functions, then it's really clumsy. Because if you want to calculate something, then you have all those arguments and you have some out argument. And imagine that you had this restriction in in another language. That, that, that all output arguments would be just out arguments in, in some position of our procedure that would just return void, let's say. It would be really clumsy. If you, if you wanted to pass this value between several functions, you have to introduce many, um, many variables just to do that. Yeah? Do you follow me? Yeah? Yeah? And this sort of comes with the nature of a problem. So it's sort of you can do it, but if you have to change several operations, you it sometimes is clumsy. There is a way to abstract that away with macros, and for example, you can use or abuse depending on, on, on the view. You can actually abuse the grammar notation to do that because the grammar, the, the, the DCG notation is implemented as a macro. This is this arrow. That, that you saw at the beginning, and that gets expanded into some other stuff during the macro expansion. And what it does is that it inserts two additional arguments to each um, each uh, row in the body. Okay. So, and, and these additional arguments are always an in argument and out argument, in argument, out argument. It sort of chains the values in this way. So if you want to change the use, you can sort of use or abuse this macro, and it does this bookkeeping of those variables that sort of are threading the state through, through, the, through the calls. So you don't have to do it this way, but in the end, many times, the argument that, that you, won't, you won't use in this way is not at the last or, uh, or, or second to last position, so you would have sort of, it, it, it's not, uh, there are cases where it just uh, gets in the way and it's slightly more verbose, you have to invent something. So it's not really that smooth in all respects and there are like, like um, sometimes I just really thought, oh, <laughs> if only I, I had, a different language, but it's it's never a, a serious a serious problem. It's just a couple of things that are annoying. That prod is not really that much. It doesn't know much about functions. So this general generality, that it works with with relations. This comes at a cost because it's not optimized to combine functions. So it's, it's sometimes it's a little bit clumsy. And I have no idea uh, whether we have, do we have some, oh, we don't have much time, do we? Do we have at least 10 minutes, 10 more minutes? And then, then um, so, so let's have a look at some code. Let's have a look at some code. In this uh, weird world, yeah, summary. Yeah, that's, that's okay. I, I enjoyed writing the, the, the program. And now, which is really a shame, I should have actually showed you the um, the um, the the web app. But for this, I would need to run it locally or I'd have to connect to the internet. Okay. Um, locus UPC? No. Locus whatever. 
I don't know. Let's try on. Oh, okay. So that's wrong. Let's try it again. A second. Yeah, of course. Oh, so, okay, great. So, uh, no. Okay, so if it's a two narrow, it just places them one under another. So if you if you take a recipe, I'll take just some recipe. Couple of recipe, uh, recipes, a recipe, whatever. Yeah, and you just oh, where is it? Here, you paste it in into the box. It sends the data to the server, and there's this prolog server that serves as an HTTP server. And as well does the calculation. So as I said, it's all in one language, no impedance mismatch, it's, it just fits nicely together. And it exposes uh, an API that does that splits the input text at certain points and returns a JSON structure with annotations that belong to those uh, fragments. So it's it's like you can you can you can use the service without this specific UI. So this is just a simple patent using JavaScript that makes a, a call, uh, a Jeff call, and it just uh, it just asks the API and gets the annotated fragments and then formats them in this way. So okay, so the formatting is in JavaScript. I was like sort of lying to you a little bit. So I didn't write the client in Pro. If I could, I would have to do that, but but, uh, but I didn't. Uh, I don't know how to run Prolog in, in in the browser in an easy way, but may, maybe there is a way. Yeah, some compilers I can imagine where. Yeah, and so this is it. So so it annotates so and. There are really crazy combinations that you can use. So the grammar is really non-trivial. So I can say, okay, so let's say two, two and a half ounces of something. And it parses it because it has a very, like, uh, the parser is sort of rich. <laughs> so it really, it, um, it has a lot of grammar rules for various combinations using those DCG grammars. Okay? And you actually encounter this kind of stuff in the, in the recipes. So it, it parses this as a number and the word and and the optional optional a, so if, if, if there was the, uh, no A, so it, it would still work, at least I, I, I suppose so. Let's, uh, oh. Yeah, so it's uh, some optional stuff here, and it recognizes that it's an ounce, so it converts it, like, it, it adds the 2 and 0.5 together to 2.5, and then it converts it. Or you can use Various. Yeah, but but what it, it's you don't usually encounter this kind of right. I went through a lot of recipes and I didn't encounter this combination. So the grammar rule just matches the, the this part. So the result is different. So maybe this is a bug. I don't know. But I noticed in the previous recipe that the. Uh, all purpose flour was converted into milliliters and grams. Yeah, while so the whole grain flour was not. Why is this case? 
Okay, so it's just uh, uh, it's just that uh, that uh, I'm lazy and uh, I just implemented um, just sugar and flour. I, I I filled the knowledge base of the program with densities for flour and for sugar. Yeah, but but there are course. many sorry there are many kinds of flours. Okay. So, so, so usually I match the whole phrase. So if there are some quantifier, uh, some some modifiers, then I don't match it because it, it usually implies that it's some different kind of it. And in general, it can mean that the conversion to grams won't be very accurate, okay. especially with um, I don't know uh, with uh, sugars. Uh, various sugars uh, can have, of course, sugar per se chemically uh, has a given density, but Depending on the granularity and the shape of the grains and whatever, you can have different uh, densities. So, okay. but, but the, the, the main point is that uh, I just didn't uh, have uh, the nerves to really fill the database with uh, the, the knowledge. Yeah. yeah. So, so it does a lot of. Um, it it is able to to do a lot of conversions, let's say. I, I won't go through all of them, but the grammar is not really, really that simple. And uh, let's have a look at the program. Where is the program? What's the program? So here's the program. Can you read the letters? Yeah. So, um, I start with some grammar rules that are no, not interesting. <laughs> this is just uh, some convenience grammar rules that are doing uh, upper to lower case conversions. So I can have a grammar rule that ignores case, for example, and extracts the content of the token, ignoring the case, just converts everything to lower case. Or I can have a different grammar rule that matches the token and extracts the original value without the conversion. So it, it, it turns out to be pretty useful to have these sort of convenience uh, capabilities. Yeah, but what's more interesting is that I'm mixing the domain knowledge with the grammar rules. So this is the mixing that I was talking about. So here I'm using the DCG sort of sub-language or macro. And I'm saying, OK, uh, what is a white space? Well, a white space is anything that is a token of type white space. So first, I have a tokenizer that labels the tokens. And it um, has four categories of tokens. Do you want to see the tokenizer, perhaps? Well, it's a token I have, token I have. Just not, not that interesting. It labels the tokens with some categories. It's white space, or a number, or a letter, or everything else. Yeah? And then I say, OK, so a right, white space is a token that is a white space. Um, then try white space is a grammar rule that says, OK, optional white space. Try to match a white space in the stream of tokens. But if, if it's not there, uh, it's okay. Just try to match it and swallow it if you can. And if it's not there, just uh, just uh, go ahead. So I have a try phrase meta rule. So this is sort of a meta a higher order grammar rule. Yeah, a higher order grammar rule that takes a grammar rule as a parameter. And this matches when, when this matches, or, or the other possibility is just ignore it and, and go ahead. So I can make any phrase optional using this higher order grammar rule, which I will try phrase. Yeah. Then I need some domain knowledge. So I just say, OK, so. This stuff is something like a dash. I don't know the official names for it, but I don't care. So here I have a list of all Unicode symbols that resemble a dash in, a, in some way. 
And I can ask the prolog database. So I, I can call this predicate. I can call this dash light, uh, dash like. Uh, where is it? Uh, here. Yeah. I have a dash, dash like. And it is completion. That's nice. It has completion. So you can use uh, dash like. And uh, where you are. Yeah, and I, I want all them that are of the kind hyphen, yeah? So, oh yeah, so it has some namespaces and it, it told me, okay, I, I can't find this thing in, 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 in the user namespace, but I could find this predicate in this namespace, you want to, to use it. So it has some very nice correction capabilities. Uh, let's say yes. And it tells me that there are only two of them, of those six or, or whatever, that are actually uh, hyphens, according to the database that I uh, input. Yeah. Let's try something else. Oh no! So so it's not able to do this, but I can. Just sort of. Yeah. Uh, sort of um, advertisement, yeah. So, sweet prolog, as you as you just as wi prolog, has this nice feature of actually correcting your inputs. So if you have a typo here, it just corrects it. it says, okay, so you actually meant this one. You didn't do that. That's nice. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. And now I have a lot of more domain knowledge. So I, I'm just encoding the knowledge of how uh, the numerals work. Yeah, so I say, okay, so the word one is the number one. And so I'm encoding the domain knowledge. And I mix it with, with other stuff. So now I, I, I define what is a number, word. Well, it's a word, a text, that happens to be one of those uh, words. So I first define the knowledge, and then I sort of use this knowledge in the grammar rule. And let's go. And then there's a lot of rules. Various rules, the simple number, and slash, and fraction, and Unicode fractions, and just sort of declare what's known, and then you can use this knowledge in, in, in those uh, predicates. A silly number, that's when you have one space and a fraction, and you are supposed to add them together, like this notation. Do you know what I mean? This. This. This actually means 1.5. Yeah? It's silly. But you have to parse it somehow. Um, okay, a decimal. And it's all grammar rules. It's all grammar rules. And I have here a database of all the units that you could possibly encounter in all possible ways how they are written, with all possible ways how this s s little circle can be written, yeah? So it's really messy. The problem is messy. Not the solution. Unique? Sorry? Are they always unique? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, if uh, you can have uh, different Something as the same uh, with the, if uh, on the right side of the screen, does it have a unique or somehow there could be two different names, could mean different, one name could mean different things, and depending on um, context, you can. I, I'm not really sure that. 
I know exactly what you are talking about. If you somebody uh, use the mm-hmm. foreground G, and G could also mean oh, yes. gram. Oh, I see. And of course, yes. Yeah. If you found kilograms, then somebody will buy the. It G. turns out that in reality there tends to be me. But if they weren't, I would be able to express some sort of a constraint that that says, okay, so use some other information to sort it out. So, so it, it, it would be actually quite easy to, to solve this ambiguity in problem. So you, you can have several constraints on, on, on matching those strings, and one of those constraints could use some sort of information like whether it's um, which kind of uh, food it is, or something like that. And it could try to find the combinations that do make sense with respect to, 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 the, uh, to the model that I am using. So this, is a, this problem actually, it would be very, um, actually quite easy to solve, but I didn't have to solve it. It, it, it turned that, that they are, <laughs> they are. If they weren't, it, it, would not be a, it wouldn't be a problem. Uh. In this case, it, it would be a problem, but it would be easy to solve it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And this is a, a optimization macro. So, so this is a, a macro that I wrote in, draw, in order to make this matching efficient. So I can, I sort of this is a mini language that serves to describe a set of keywords. And it gets translates to an efficient representation that's able to match those keywords really quickly. If I didn't do that, then what probably would happen is that Prolog would just try one after another until it finds the one that matches. And that's not very efficient. So what I did is I, I, I used, I created a sort of a mini language that describes those sets of keywords. It's sort of almost ridiculous to call it a language, but it's, it's, it serves its well-defined purpose. The language is just a list of pairs where the first uh, is a, an internal name for this group. I don't care which one of those keywords it was, it's always a gal. So I'm just saying, okay, an internal name corresponds to this set of keywords uh, that are to be matched in the input text. And um, I just translated it into a... Uh, a messy but efficient rep- representation. And I could perhaps try to somehow uh, find definition. Let's look at. Mm, the macro. Yeah, it's too, it's too late. Too too bad. Um, I don't want to to. Okay, I'll skip it. Yeah. I think that's it pretty much. So mainly grammar rules. One last thing, the server. So this is the server and and I I will stop here, yeah? So I'm just saying in order to run the server, you just say, okay, so we use some libraries that implement some uh, useful stuff if you want to run run a HTTP server for dispatching and for threads and whatever, and from for, for, for this, I forgot what is it, of course, if, if you want to be able to call the API from other domains, then you have to do some sort of gymnastics. I, I'm not really a web developer. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I somewhat found that I have to do this. <laughs> so it supports that, and you just declare the handlers, it's a very nice declarative way to to specify the server, you say, okay, so, so the root should be redirected uh, to some, something else. Then you handle the favicon. Oh, what was that? Yeah. Then you, ha- you handle the jQuery stuff. So if I want to, either I use the, uh, I'm able to provide my own copy of jQuery if it's not possible to download the, the one provided by, uh, by Google. 
or by another, another delivery network. And yes, yeah, so I of course have to handle the requests for the for the page. And then there is this API. So that's sort of separate, this API. Uh, and it's just a JSON API. It, it receives JSON requests, calls the prolog code, and, and returns a JSON with the fragments of the text and with the annotations. And, and that's the whole server. So it was really nice experience, no, no, no complicated setup, just that just. So, yeah, that's pretty much all. I showed you some protocol code that does something, unfortunately. Can you not in my detail, but. Can you run it in the opposite direction? So, given the translated recipe. That's a very good one. question. That's a great question. The answer is almost. Yeah? <laughs> um, there are places where I, I sort of gave up and wrote it in a way that cannot be run in the other direction. If you try to do it, it just tends to tells you that uh, arguments are not uh, instantiated. Yeah. So, so it, 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 it throws an exception. It doesn't fail. It, it outright throws an exception. Yeah. So, so it tells you, okay, so this could possibly be a valid, valid way to call this predicate, but it's not sort of implemented or something like that. But it would not be too hard to modify it in a way that would run in both ways. I could do it, but it would be some work. So I have some parts of the programs that are not pure prolog, and this causes this uh, asymmetry. So this really breaks the relational nature a little bit. But it can be done. And it's not really too hard to do it in the other way. Then you would have to try sort of backwards and generate various uh, various um, combinations of units and numbers and that. So that's it. So now questions. There are some red cards in the in the drawer. Um I think I do. <laughs> I think I do. So it's um, really, really, then, and in, in, in the end, I just sort of gave up and uh, wrote it sort of procedurally, especially those parts that are not likely to be run in. Um, so, so the grammar. That's 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 the fuzzy boundary between the logical and extra logical code. So there are parts that really can be run both ways. So then there are parts that can't. And but I really don't use too many cups. I, I use uh, other facilities to force prolog to stop searching. That's for efficiency reasons. So, so, I, so you, you want to just tell prolog, okay, so don't try to find any more solutions. That would be a waste of time. So I tend to use once to, to restrict uh, the search space. Just find one solution. I can see one of the five. I know. <laughs> but no, no, no. Just, just. I, I think it, it maybe it doesn't have to be there after all. The point is that in certain cases, Prolog actually found all the solutions, but it doesn't know that it found all of them. So it still thinks that there might be one more. So if you use the cut, it just it just saves some memory. It doesn't have to keep track. It's just a good yeah. choice. Sorry, it's not a red cut. No. So, but but I'm at that point. I'm not really sure about that one. So I spent most of the time developing the other stuff. I actually don't remember why. But, uh, yeah, why why I put the cut here? Not, not a problem because I, I remember a colleague from the university writing. I don't use too many of them. I don't use too many of them. Yeah, okay. And mainly in, in, in parts of the program that are not, I mean, you can use Prolog just as a imperative language, sort of. You can do that. You just use cuts everywhere. You disable the backtracking. You disable. You just tell Prolog, okay, so never try and try again. Just go ahead. 
you can, and, and that's fine. I, I think that um, it's just a tool, so there is no, it's nothing bad about using the engine to do stuff that are not logical, it's just a tool. So the problem is that you have to clearly separate which parts are logical, are clearly logical, and which are not. So that's the problem. So not extra logical code, so code that doesn't behave in this strictly relational sense, is not a problem. But the problem is when someone expects that it should behave logically, it doesn't. And that's perhaps some sort of a convention could uh, solve this problem. And you call all predicates, use some naming, I don't know, that indicates that it's not a logical predicate or whatever. But it's not a real solution. So this is, it can be solved, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a problem. It's, there's the absence of the clear separation of those kinds of code. Uh, is there a way to expose this code like in a library and upload it somewhere in some library store so it can be used like in some uh, another place like program with import statement or stuff like that? Yes, it is. Um, actually, the parsing code is a module. So, so here you have it's a module and it, it exports for now it exports just uh, the main the main predicate that is actually just used as a function because it has two arguments, but you always, at that point, you always use it in a way that you provide the input to the first argument and you get the output from the second argument, so we actually use it as a function. Yeah. And I export this function predicate from the model. And then you can import the model elsewhere. So if I, it's on GitHub, or no, it's on Bitbucket, but I didn't need it open source it. So I may do so in some time in the future. We sort of hope that if you did it really well, that perhaps it could be sort of useful, maybe commercially, but it turned out to be not so easy to to sell it. I know a couple of people who use it here, but those are my friends, so you never know whether they... It's a, it's a specific... Like, I, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I, I will open source it someday. <laughs> Is it useful to convert the teaspoons and cups to milliliters? I think in the US they have the same size. They have a bigger size. Cups they have... Than in oh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the thing is that all those measures are actually very well defined and the uh, people in the US, they have like special spoons that <laughs> serve, that, that, um, that, yeah, they have some measuring spoons for that. They don't use just regular spoons. They have a special set of spoons. Okay, so this... Oh, yeah, yeah, good. Ah, mm. ah okay. I don't know whether that's the right. You see? Huh? So you need to decide which one is it? No, they are this one tablespoon, one half. Fine. But you have a lot of different ways. You can so, so sometimes sometimes they write just T and T means like a teaspoon, I think. If it's a capitalized T, it's a tablespoon. If it's not, then it's a teaspoon. Or they write TSP or TBSP or TBSPN or something, and they have like a lot of ways to, a lot of keywords to indicate that it's a teaspoon or, 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 or a tablespoon and so on. Okay. Your question about that and green.
uh, brings me to the question. Uh, how it is to collaborate on a project? I mean, if it's easy to uh, put there a trap. That breaks the, the breaks properties, the yes. And, uh, not to mention. So, I don't know if you have uh, collaborated on a project before, so how it uh, works in this way, when you, it's, I mean, it's just one character, it could, uh, could have different meanings and different implications for a program, and if the programmers are not, let's say, well behaved, then you can run uh, quickly into problems. Yes, that's basically the case, that it, it is a problem, and just, there is no type system to prove which cuts are okay, which preserve the logical semantics and which break. And I can imagine that you could, you could in principle, create such a prover. Uh, most likely you use Prolog to, to uh, write such a prover. prover. But um, maybe there are some, yeah? but uh, I, I didn't use them. So I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know, but it's not like a standard stuff that is done for you for free. So you have to be careful or not use, uh, not use cuts. Try to avoid them in some way. It's not easy every time to avoid them. It's not even possible in many cases. So the thing is that basically you should try to isolate them and um, just be careful and use them only in some very well understood and reused code. So really isolate them and write them very carefully and, and then reuse that sort of uh, code that's been very carefully written. So not to use them anywhere, any, uh, everywhere. That's just a pragmatic solution to this problem. Or you can write a code that's explicitly not logical. It's just some sort of a script that does a couple of things. It's easy, for example, to to run uh, to to open to run the web browser from Prolog. I used it like last week when there was some page that was broken, and there were a couple of links, but they were somehow broken used to else, elsewhere. But I knew the pattern of the URL. I, I needed to view all the links and the pictures that were there, but, but the page was broken. So I just wrote a prolog one-liner, it was really easy, that generated all those strings and opened the web browser at the, at the appropriate address, addresses, uh, several tabs, and at the end there was false, so it was a fail-driven loop. So when I ran it, it just went through all the possibilities, trying to find the one that's True, but all were fair, false, so it just tried and tried and tried. So I used this looping technique, and uh, yeah, it's just a funny way to write a loop, but, but it was actually pretty concise and very, 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 uh, very nice. Very short one liner to achieve. So, and that's not a, a usage that really is, has to do with the relations at all, it's just a procedural program. You can use it in other ways too. It's not, it's not forbidden. I have two more tricky questions. First one which comes into mind is how do you, you have tried to represent the probability or ambiguity of rules? For example, I think this part of the recipe is uh, gram. I'm 50% sure it's a one gram and not one gram. And somehow work with the uh, probability of uh, rules. And the second question is if you have uh, some corpus of different recipes and you know some rules, and if you could somehow infer the rules, for example, if uh, you see that there is a big thing, a lot of one things, maybe you ask it a user, I think there is a rule which you have been uh, covered. So please enter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so I uh, I didn't do this kind of like machine learning stuff using Prolog, but uh, actually it can be done, and um, there is there are some people uh, who are doing it uh, here. I don't know at, at uh, the Electrotechnics Faculty, and they are doing a very interesting thing that they are writing. They have a variant of Prolog that has it's fuzzy. It, it has some some constants in it. You can you can annotate the Prolog program with like constants that that, that say okay. So this rule is true only with, to, to the extent of one point seven in a way. So so they can sort of make the program fuzzy, and then they can translate it to a neural network which has coefficients uh, that are coupled to each other so as to reflect the structure of the problem